Good morning, my brothers and sisters. This is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 I'll be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. And it reads, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pastor. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. This is our call to worship.
Y'all heard the song, get up if you're on the Lord's side. Get on up, get on up if you're on the Lord's side. It's something about knowing whose side you're on. I don't know how it makes you feel today, but I'm happy to know that I'm on the Lord's side. And even more happy to know that he's on my side. And if he's on my side, he's more than the world against me. I don't know about you, but I'm just glad to be in the house today. Oh, my God. Man, I know y'all like to get on me because I get a little excited up here, but y'all, hey, God has been too good. So if you would, please stand with me for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, God. You've been better to us than we can be to ourselves. Father God, if we had 10,000 tongues, if we had a million tongues, God, we couldn't thank you enough. God, you woke us up this morning, God. You saved us just another day, God. Not because of us, but in spite of us, God. You showed us mercy. So, Lord, we just come to say thank you. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to smile upon us, that you would bless us, God. You promised in your word that you would be with us, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Father God, we stand on your word right now, Father. There is so much evil going on in the world, but Lord, we know that you are bigger than anything that is happening. God, you are more than all the evil that is out here. God, we just ask that you would bless the man that will bring the word today. Father God, let him down in your storehouse that he would bring a word that is relevant right to us, Father God. Prepare the hearts of people to receive your word, that it would fall on good ground. Lord, we just ask that you would bless every family represented here, those that are watching online, that they would be blessed in God, that they would have all that they have need of. God, we just love on you today, God. We lift you today, God. We glorify you today, God. We give you honor and we give you glory. And it is all in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. 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 Shiloh. 
me and he's right keeping now. me right, right now. Lord, Lord, Lord. Please join me in reciting our mission and vision statement. The mission of the Greater Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church is to reach, teach, and baptize throughout the world. Beginning in our community, fulfilling the Great Commission by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit until Jesus returns. We will fulfill this mission through evangelism, discipleship, ministry, fellowship, and worship. The results will be spiritual, numeric, ministry, and mission growth. Amen. Our responsive reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, and Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14. It is entitled Spiritual Warfare, and it reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked. Praying always with all power and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantedness, not in strife and envy altogether, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearers and the doers of his almighty word, for this is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning, Greater Shiloh family and friends, and thank you for worshiping with us today. Today is Building Fund Sunday. Please prepare your special offering for our capital projects. Please join the Intercessory Prayer Ministry on tomorrow and every Monday morning for prayer at 6 o'clock a.m. Call 848-220-3300 and enter access code 796525 pound sign to join. Also, you can join the intercessory prayer team each Thursday evening in room 411 from 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m. for their weekly prayer meetings. All members are encouraged and welcome to attend as we intercede on behalf of each other in prayer. If you have not completed your high school diploma or GED and would like to and are between the ages of 16 and 24, we have an opportunity for you to do just that. Cornerstone Revitalization Foundation's Youth Build Program pays you to help yourself. We will help you to complete your diploma, train you for a skill, to get employment, and assist you with job placement. While in this program, you will receive $125 per week and other incentives. For more information and to sign up, visit our website at www.greatershiloh.org forward slash youthbill or contact Sherry Lewis at 
888-9750, extension 206, or via email at slewis at greatershiloh.org. School is in and it's time to celebrate. Please send in your team's accomplishments to be recognized in our TAG Spotlight. The achievement can be academic, athletic, or civic in nature. Let's celebrate our teams and all their wins. Contact Patrice Murray at gsbc at greatershiloh.org with your team's announcement. The Children's Choir will rehearse this Thursday, September 22nd at 6 o'clock p.m. and the Youth Choir at 6.30 p.m. Please contact Sarah Brown at sarah at greatershiloh.org for any questions. Attention to those going on the trip to Greece on March 22nd, 2023. The due date for the deposit has been extended to Friday, September 23rd, 2022. The minimum deposit is $600. The final payment is due January 3rd, 2023. All payments to AAA are to be made with credit card only. Questions can be directed to Jacqueline Carter at gecarter at greatershiloh.org. Our annual church conference will be held on Wednesday, September 28th at 7 o'clock p.m. asking all members to attend. Greater Shiloh's Child Development Center is currently accepting applications for full and part-time teachers as well as substitutes. The ideal candidate should have experience working with children in a daycare, preschool, or other educational ministry settings. Applicants must be dependable, flexible, and have a positive attitude. For more information, please contact Sharon Wesley, Director at 205-925-9750, extension 403, or via email at swesley at greatershiloh.org. Remember to tune in each Wednesday at noon for Pastor Wesley's weekly update and midweek inspirational message via Facebook Live. Please like and share with all of your friends on all social media platforms. Greater Shiloh is grateful to everyone for your continued financial support of our church. Check out our website at www.greatershiloh.org forward slash donate to see all the ways you can continue to give digitally. You can also drop off your tithes and offering at the church today or during regular office hours during the week. Have a blessed week, Greater Shiloh. Stay safe and join us again for worship next Sunday. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's another great day that the Lord hath made. And appropriately, our response should be, let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see you. Hey. We're used to this auditorium being full, but it doesn't matter that Jesus said we're two or three are gathered together in my name, touching and agreeing. I'll be in the midst. Amen. So we're here, and we're going to worship God. Amen. Amen. I said this morning at the 8 o'clock service, I can't help but be glad. Man, when I go to do as many funerals as we've been doing lately, and all of the traffic jams that I'm experiencing in the cemetery, Man, you can't hear, I, I'll stay in here all day. If that's an alternative, I would. I'd be here, baby. And I'm glad to be here. Got a few pastoral announcements that I'd just like to share with you, a few points of emphasis. First and foremost, I want to um, acknowledge some cards of thanks that have come from members. The first one say to the Greater Shiloh Church family, uh, cause what you did was doubly nice, doubly sweet, and thoughtful too, and just so typical of you. And it comes from Deacon Arthur Young and family in the recent passing of his wife. Here's another card of thank. No words can express our thankfulness for your prayers, calls, and the love you've shown during our recent sickness and recovery. And that came from Brother Maurice and Willette Boyd. Maurice was in the eight o'clock service and it was good to see him here at that time. And here's a card praying, the Lord blesses your given heart in abundant measure 
Thank you from the members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Jefferson County Alumni Chapter, uh, Ms. Joyce Early, President. They recently held a memorial service here for one of their beloved sisters and just wanted to express some thanks. They also left a love offering. Here in addition to that, uh, you heard on the video announcements concerning the trip to Greece as we're tracing the footsteps of the Apostle Paul that'll come up in March of 23. The deadline for the deposit has been extended to March 22nd. I mean, should I say September 23rd, which will be this Friday. And the minimum deposit is $600, just a minimum of $600. And then the final payment is due in January. So if you're planning to go, please make sure that you take advantage of the opportunity. If you need some support, let us know some kind of way. And we'll, we're working on some things to help those that want to participate to participate. Amen? All right. We want to give you, uh, in addition to that, uh, prayers continually are being requested by loved ones and church members. We're praying continually for the Osborne family. Ms. Doretha was funeralized here on Friday. We're praying for the Ingram family. Is Amanda's mother was funeralized yesterday. And we announced the passing of Miss Emily Webb. Emily is the sister of Miss Josephine Barton and Anita Black. And that funeral will be held here at Greater Shallow on this Wednesday at 11 a.m. So we ask that you, those who would normally participate in that process, that you would make sure that you are available. The annual church business meeting is going to be on Wednesday, September 28th. It is a time where we do two things. We evaluate and look at what has happened this year, and we forecast where we're going in the new church year. Our fiscal year, we operate on a fiscal year from October 1 to September 30th, and we're excited about what God has done, and I think you'll be as well when you see the information. We're also announcing the beginning of small groups for the fall. Fall small groups will begin in October. We're going to have a special training session on October 2nd for facilitators. We're looking for persons who would love to facilitate a group. We want groups everywhere. We're going to be doing the study beginning life together. Well, we're going to explore the purposes, biblical purposes, for why you are on the earth. And it's going to be a great study time. And we would love for you to participate in that process. We'll have videos available for video teaching. And we'll do, like I said, the workshop on the 2nd of October, Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, to help facilitators make ready for that particular process. I'd like to just take a moment and welcome the class of J.O. of 1979. Are you here with us this morning? Hey, oh, there you are. Oh, that's that August body. Amen. <laughs> Celebrating how many years? 70 years of Western Olin, Jackson Olin, slash as a school. Wonderful Western civilization. Amen. <laughs> so glad to have you. Regina Wyndham. Hey, that's Regina's class. Proud of you, girl, and proud of all of you. Thank you for being with us today. Hey, we're going to still have a good time. You're going to have a good time. We're going to worship the Lord. That's what we come to do. We come. Anybody come to praise God? Amen. Amen. That's what we're here for. And we're glad you're with us today. Anybody first time visiting with us? Is your first time visiting with us? Just slip up your hand right here. Hey, listen, please know that you're welcome, and we want to invite you to come again. Amen. Amen. Come on, brothers. It's about time. Now, the brothers going to turn loose in just a minute. We're going to get ready to give. Now, during our giving time, we're still pre, post, middle, mid pandemic. So we walk and give. We don't pass the basket. You know, one, one of the deacons told me one time that I wanted to turn the lights down. He said, Pastor, don't turn them lights down now. Pookie in here. And, and they want to they wanna withdraw, <laughs> not deposit. So we, we let you walk and deposit, okay? So we're going we're gonna to pray. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you for the blessing of giving. Thank you that you are the example of giving. You gave us your beloved son. And we thank you for giving us resources that we can share 
in the ministry of the church. And we pray that you would receive from us what we bring now. Bless those who bring little, bless those who bring much. May it all be received today and cleansed and used in ways that bless your name. Thank you for every giver. Receive us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, the men's going to sing a little song now called Glory to God in the Highest. And then they'll get ready so you can walk and give doing the song. Hey, hey, let's get ready for the sermon coming your way. If anybody's got a right to celebrate, it's a class of 79. Did God bring you? You ought to give him praise. Amen. He's brought me a long way. A mighty long way. Listen. I can't let a day go by without praise. I can't forget from whence I came. Oh, I can't let a day go by without counting the cost. No, I can't let a day go by without praying. No, I can't let a day go by. Day go by. No, 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 I can't let a day go by. Day go by. Without I I've been through the fire, and I've been through some floods. Like a good soldier, God knows, God knows I've been tried. But I got a story, and it's gotta be told. He brought me out, yes, he did, like you go. That's why I can't let a day go by. I cannot forget, no. Lord, from whence I came. No, I can't let a day go by. I can't let a day go by. I 
cannot keep it all to myself. <laughs> I've got to run, 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 run on, run on and tell somebody else. Listen. Hold on. God some praise. Come on and praise him. Come on and praise him. that opportunity. I want to let a day go by without checking with Jesus. So thankful and grateful for the privilege now that we have to open together God's word. So join me now in a moment of prayer as we prepare our hearts for what the Lord will say to us in the morning message. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you now for the blessing of life and for the gift. For this past week, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs. We thank you for bringing us through it all. We thank you for allowing us to lie down last night and to have rest and to energize our bodies with a desire to want to be up this morning and in the house of prayer. And since we've been here, we thank you for sign songs that have lifted us, for prayers that have covered us, and now, Lord, for the word that will instruct us. So God, I pray once again that you would lift your human out of self. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Speak to us and through us in this moment. And bless now again the word that is in our mouth and the meditation that's on our heart. That it may be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we ask it now in the name of your son Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just love that song. I love that music, man. We got a great music team. I'm grateful. Why don't you give them some, show them some love. Amen. I tend to preach a lot from the Old Testament, so this morning we're going again.
to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 1. First nine verses, just to kind of set it in your mind, as we'll begin here and be able to be here in the next couple weeks in this particular book. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. In the year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the, of the, into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skilled in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among them of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael, the name of Abend uh, Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the princes of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor with tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. This is the word of God for the people of God. I'm preaching this morning about the results of an uncompromised life. The results of an uncompromised life. America is in a crisis, and I want to be honest with you, it's going to get worse. Never in our country have we faced the challenges that we're facing today. In the political arena, uh, they are among one of the major parties in our nation, and I don't mind telling you the Republican Party, there are factions that are determined that they're not going to recognize the lawful election of certain public officials, in particular, the office of president. And as a result, they are digging in deeper and we're facing midterm elections and people are going to have to decide whether or not you are with democracy or whether you're with something else. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are compromising. They can't stand, they, 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 they can't stand on the conviction of what they know is right and lawful for this land. And, 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 and it, it's, putting, it, it, it's putting people in very uncomfortable circumstances. 
even on the job that you work on. Sometimes it's hard to even engage in conversation because people don't want to offend somebody else. And it causes sometimes even some divisions within the home circle where people sometimes want to have normal conversations around the table, but it ends up blowing up into something that it shouldn't. And it's all because of the big lie. And, and, and now, I'm sorry to say that the, the, the former president, and this is not a message on politics by all no means, but I'm just teaching on compromising life. The former president is almost literally threatening the United States government to, and challenging them, you better not prosecute me. For if you do, you're going to regret it and there will be some consequences in the streets of the cities of these communities, unlike what you know. Now, if that's not national putting the nation and putting people in a situation where people are going to have to choose. Supreme justices are going to have to decide that they either going to exact the law or they're going to have to compromise. There are a whole lot of people who talk a good game who say they're for right until it affects them. There are a whole lot of people who say they are for democracy until it means that I may not win another election. There are a whole lot of people who say they are for certain standards. Now, I'm going to take it out of the realm of politics and bring it on a little closer to you. There are a whole lot of people who think that they are for right until a compromise might put a little bit more money in my pocket. And, 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 and so living an uncompromised life is almost unheard of in our society because people play the game that I would do what is expedient for me. And if it means me looking the other way, if it means me not speaking up toward the truth, if it means me not saying anything or not putting this down on my tax, whatever is necessary, we find ourselves going there. And we find ourselves compromising even as it relates to our beliefs. Our faith is compromised. We don't want to stand on convictions. We raise our families with compromise. We don't, have, we don't want to be absolute with our children. There was a time when certain things were just the way it was. And there was no ifs, ands, and buts about it. But people everywhere compromise. And it's creeping into the church. And, and what, a, what a different world this would be if we could get back to the principles of living uncompromised lives. What a different nation this would be. What a different generation this would be. What a different community this would be if we lived uncompromising lives. So that's why I want to talk about this this morning. Because what you got to learn to do, even as Christians, you have to learn to stand on principles and leave the results up to God. You have to be willing to stand on the truth even when it hurts. Even when it bothers you, even when it means you're not going to be popular, even it mean, when it means you may not necessarily be accepted by everybody, you have to be willing to take a stand. And I came to say today, I would rather stand and be unpopular than stand with God and let him have my back. Out of all the people in the Bible, there were many who compromised. They really did. They really Adam compromised. He listened to Eve, and they lost paradise. Abraham compromised. He listened to his wife and almost lost her and got put out of the, the country. He compromised again and got with Hagar and had a child, Ishmael, and now there's been constant war in the Middle East because Jews and Arabs can't get along. All because of a compromise. Ishmael, Esau compromised. 
his birthright with Jacob for a bowl of soup. And people have been compromising down through the centuries. But here in the pages of this holy writ stands one young man who becomes a perfect example of an uncompromised life. And his name is Daniel. Daniel lived in the southern kingdom of Judah during the last days of the southern kingdom's stance. They were under assault by the northern kingdom, by, should I say, by the Babylonians. God had tried to warn the nation of Israel, period, that they should not compromise their lives. He had said when he brought them out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses, and when they were moved into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all of the children of Israel had agreed that they would do that. As soon as they got in the land of Canaan and they saw the worship practices of the Canaanites, how they involved themselves in licentious worship, how they participated in sexual misbehaviors and called it religion, the children of Israel said, look, we got to change churches. And so they walked away from their faith in God and began to practice idolatry. And as a result, God was displeased. He tried to warn them through taking the northern kingdom captive. He won the southern kingdom of Judah. You're going to have to get it together. 135 years later, they were still disobedient. And God raised up the Chaldees, the Babylonians. And they came against the children of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he besieged, he surrounded the city of Jerusalem and intended to starve the people by cutting off supplies from letting anything come out of the city or any supply wagons come into the city. But I shared earlier that he got a message that his father was sick, and he had to leave Jerusalem and go back to Babylon. And so he appointed one of his top officials whose name was Aspenaz. And he said to Aspenaz, Aspenaz, listen, what I want you to do, I want you to go through the city of Jerusalem and I want you to take out of Jerusalem some of the brightest and best of the young men, especially those who have royal blood in them. And so that you don't misunderstand who I'm looking for, let me describe what I want. I want you to find young men who don't have any blemishes. I want you to look at them physically. I want you to look at their faces. I want you to look at their bodies. I don't want anybody who has blemish because, see, how many know that people choose leaders who look good? Men choose women who look good. And women choose men who look good. Hello, somebody, don't pretend now. Because nobody want to wake up next to Freddy Krueger or wake up to somebody that you have to say, what? So people tend to make decisions based upon physical characteristics. And so Ashpenaz was instructed. And not only do I want you to check out their physical capacity, but then don't bring no dummies. <laughs> bring those who are of the highest intellectual quality. Because the idea, the big plan was, we ultimately are going to carry all of the people of Israel out of their land and bring them into Babylon. And in order to control them, we got to make leaders out of people from their own country. So they had a scheme, they had a plan. And what the plan was, was to take the teenagers, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, and put them through the Babylonian culture and schools and all, and brainwash them so that they think and act like Babylonians and then we're going to set them over the Israelites 
but they will be really Babylonians in their heart. And so that was the plan. And although uh, the, the, the Aspenaz, some people believe that was a government title, but it was really a name. He went through and he chose boys out of Jerusalem and he brought them back to Babylon. And for these boys, you already know about. The first one, whose name is Daniel, he changed his name from Daniel to Belshazzar. He changed the name of Hananiah to the name of Shadrach. They changed the name of Mishael to Meshach. And they changed the name of Azariah to Abednego. And now there was nothing wrong with changing the name, but it was part of the scheme. See, the plot to brainwash these boys were well, threefold. The first step in that plot was to change their name, change their identities so that they no longer identified with Jewish names. They gave them Babylonian names. Now, now you and I don't ever worry about somebody changing our name because we get called names all the time, every one of us. People call your name. Some of them you don't hear, but they call you one. Trust me, they do. You walk down the hall, and mm -hmm, there she go, there he go. You know how it is, man. They got a name. Every one of us probably they had a nickname or two when we were growing up. And people still call your name. But just because they call you a name, you know that doesn't determine who you are. When you know within who you are, it doesn't matter what they put a title or not on the name. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are not worried because they changed their name. That was just the first stage of the brainwashing. The second stage was to change not only their identities, but to change, come on with me this morning, their understanding really is what they wanted to do. They wanted to change and, 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 and make these people somebody different. They wanted to change their education so that they would not think like Israelites. The plan was to put them in school in Babylon and to teach them for three years all of the customs, all of the language, all of the behaviors of the Babylonians, teach them science, teach them all of the academic, the higher learning skills so that they could be successful. Now, nothing wrong with secular education. All of us, many of us have went through secular schools. That doesn't change who we are. Changing my name, giving me a secular education, all of that doesn't bother me. My mama raised me. I knew who I was when I left out of her house. And it didn't matter what school I went to, that still did not determine my belief system. Because when you live in a household, and you grow up in a household 18, 19 years, you know who you are. You understand what you believe. And so Daniel, 14, 15 years old, understood who he was because his mama now had put some in him ever before he left home. But the third part of the brainwashing experience, a plan of the Babylonians, was to change not only their name, not only to change their education, but to change their lifestyle. And this is where Bab John, but this boy Daniel has a problem. They, they said, Aspenaz said, look, the king, king Nebuchadnezzar said, I want you to take away their diet, their Jewish kosher foods. And I want you to give them food from the king's table. And I want you to give them wine. And, 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 and Daniel, now, this is, this, is what, this is what I love, man. This is what I love. Now, there would not have been anything wrong with being wine and dine for a 14-year-old. Coming into a new country, parents left behind, 
most of his peers nowhere to be seen, it would have been an ego thing for a young boy to sit at the king's table and eat the meat that the king had eaten and to be able to drink his wine. But Daniel, listen, this is what's so amazing, is uncompromising in his stance at the age of 14. And he decides very decisively that I am not going to do it. Man, that is, that is unheard of. That is tremendous. And that lays out the foundation for the rest of this book because this boy decides. Listen, he doesn't say to Ashpenaz, Look, I don't want the food, man. I can't eat the king's meat. And I can't drink the wine because, you know, I don't like the seasoning that you Babylonians use. It's not the same as what we are used to. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I can't eat it because I have physical ailments that will affect me if I ate it. I have ulcers and I have other kinds of digestive problems that won't allow me to partake of that dietary concern. That's not what he says. He says, I won't do it because it will defile me. Now, Ashpenaz knew that he wasn't talking about something physical. He knew that this was a spiritual matter. Now, here's what I want to help you understand, because I'm going to give you 89 points, about seven points, seven things I want you to understand about the results. Here is a young boy who makes up his mind that he is not going to compromise, that he's not going to give up his religious convictions to participate in a pagan culture. And what happens as a result of that? The first thing that happens or the first thing characteristic of a person who is an uncompromiser is that that person is going to be unashamedly bold. I mean, Daniel steps up and at 14 he's saying, I'm not ashamed of my God. I'm not ashamed of my religion. I'm not ashamed of what I believe. Daniel understood that food that had been served in pagan cultures had been offered to pagan gods. And he did not want to be defiled. Now, let's look at the issue of wine. Boy, when I was 14, I was introduced to it. You understand? I'm serious. I was ninth grader in high school. And the boys came by to pick me up for a Friday night party. And I got in the car and they had Budweiser. Oh, don't y'all pretend that you have never been introduced to. And I participated because I thought that that would lift me, that that would make me acceptable among my peers, among my friends. You understand? So I compromised. But Daniel, Daniel said, no, I don't, I don't want it. And, and it's not that there was any dietary restrictions for Jewish people to drink wine because these were days before Birmingham Waterworks. So they weren't drinking water because it was pure. The, 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 wine was culture. Wine was very much in the Jewish culture. When Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding that started the beginning of his ministry, he participated, he served it, and the governor of the feast said, you say the best for last. So it was nothing wrong in the Jewish culture about drinking wine. But Daniel said, I'm not going to have it. He said, I'm going to abstain from it. And some theologians believe that he may have abstained because he had taken a Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite vow was described in the book of Numbers chapter 6. 
And there were three requirements for a Nazarite. One, that a Nazarite would not touch any alcohol. Said no alcohol. That means no Hennessy. <laughs> that means no, no Jack. That mean, come on, don't pretend. That means no Tango Ray. <laughs> That mean no Chirac. That, 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 that mean no Crown. <laughs> that mean no Merlot. That mean no Moscata. Come on, don't y'all pretend. You act, you act like you don't know. Just go on and touch somebody. Say, oh, thank God I'm not a Nazarite. Thank God I'm not. <laughs> thank God I'm not a Nazarite. <laughs> so... So Daniel may have refused because he knew that he had been set apart for a divine purpose. But whatever the reason, the boy was bold. And it set the precedence for the rest of his life. Later on in chapter 6 we'll read Daniel was thrown in the lines there. Chapter 3, we read Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in the fire furnace. It was all because it starts here with the willingness and the determination not to compromise. We make decisions early in our life that will determine the outcomes of our futures. And so when a man lives or a woman lives an uncompromising life, there is going to be associated with them an unashamed boldness. The second thing that's going to happen is, and I think, man, I thought, before I leave that, let me just drop this other piece. I thought it was extremely bold because he's a captive. He's been taken captive out of his land. And he then could face execution. He could face imprisonment. He could face punishment of all kinds of things. But he's bold enough to say, I'm not going to do it. The second thing, what we learn from this kind of behavior and what we need to see more of in our culture is when people live uncompromised lives, they have an uncommon standard. See, there has to be a standard. If you're going to live right, if you're going to live an uncompromising life, you have to have a standard that you're trying to live up to. When there are no standards, anything will do. Come on, talk to me, somebody. When you, if you're a woman, if you're a man, and you have no standard, as long as they're walking, it's all right. But when you have a standard, anything or uh, anybody just won't do. When, 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 when you have a standard in your life, you just can't drive anything. You just can't look any kind of way. You just can't live anywhere. There are some things that you put in place that you want to live up to and measure up to. Now, put that in your spiritual life. If there is a standard spiritually, then it su suggests to me that my life cannot be characterized by just anything that I want to live in such a way. And Daniel was of that nature. So he said, no wine, not Jewish wine, not Babylonian wine, not wine mixed with water, not any kind whatsoever. See, people who have standards, they're the pace setters. They're the ones who lead the pack. They don't follow the pack. They're the ones who do better, who do the best, not just what's good. People who set standards are the ones who are always up to something. They are the dynamic people in society. They're not the ones who wonder what happened. They're the ones who decide what happened. But when you live an uncompromised life, you want to be a standard setter and have an uncommon standard about that. I said this morning, man, when we were growing up, man, we didn't live in a perfect house. We didn't come from a perfect family, but there were standards there. My daddy was, well, he was, man, he was a stickler about certain things. Boys couldn't come in there with a hat on their head. My daddy would come out the room, and he said, son, that, this, this house has a roof on it, and you had to take that hat off. 
Man, we, my sister and them, we having parties, man. The boys be trying to slow down, get close to the girl. My mama would embarrass everybody. She come around and tap the little boy on the shoulder. Hey, man, wake up in here. That was a standard. You couldn't pull up in front of the door and blow the horn and think somebody was going to come out and get in the car. You had to come in. And you had to be interviewed. Where your mama didn't work, where your daddy work, what side of town you live on. That was a standard. And today we don't see standards in our society. And now, now let me tell you this thing about, 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 about Daniel. Because this boy chose to have a standard and refused the wine, then the third element comes into being. There becomes an, an, an unusual protection that comes over his life. Listen, whenever you choose to live for God and you choose to live at a standard, you can expect and count on God to protect you. How I many know God will protect you? Yes, he will. Yes, 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 he will. He will throw his loving arms of mercy around you. And God will protect you. Look at what the text said. Look at what the text said. The text said, and God gave Daniel favor with Aspenaz. Won't he do it? Won't God make people bless you? Won't God make your enemy your footstool? Won't he walk with you? Won't, won't he open doors? Won't he make something happen? Anybody ever been protected by God because you chose to do what's right? You've been on a job, you had a boss who wanted to treat you ugly. You had a coworker who couldn't stand you, but they couldn't do nothing about it because God's hand of mercy was on you. They didn't want to pay you what, they, what you were worth, but God made them pay you and then give you extra. Oh man, I know what I'm talking about. I remember one time early in my career here as a pastor, man, they, they wanted, to, wanted to put the pastor on a contract and I, I didn't want to take the contract. So I said, no, I'm not going to take the contract. They had a big church meeting. They said, no, you're going you gonna to sign the contract. They had the lawyer, had everybody out here. Man, one little old lady, she's in heaven today. Thank God for her. She raised her hand. She said, I don't think pastors should have a contract. The last pastor didn't have a contract. As a matter of fact, I think y'all ought to give him a raise. They dismissed the meeting. <laughs> God will do it. God will do it. He will protect you. Listen, there were two men who were alike. That's Daniel and Joseph. Both of those boys were mistreated, but God protected both of them. They put Joseph in a prison. Potiphar's wife lied on him because she tried to play on Joe. Joe didn't want to play with her. And because he didn't want to play with her, she lied on him. Put the boy in prison, but God's hand was on him. And before anything, anybody knew anything, God had elevated him to second in command. He'll do it. No wonder David said, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Makes me lie down in green pastures. Leave me beside still water. Restore my soul. And even when I have to walk in the valley where the shadows gather and the road not marked, and no traveler tells us where they are, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. When God is with you, you don't have to worry about who's against you. Yeah, number four. When you live an uncompromising life, here is a new thing that for y'all that was here this morning. There is a persistence that will develop in your life. Uh, Daniel developed a persistence. When Ashpenaz comes to him, Ashpenaz said, man, wait a minute, you're trying to get me hurt. You know the king has put me over you guys. And you know the king has said to me, I want you to feed them my wine and my meat. And when I check them out, I expect them to all look good and to have some knowledge in their head. And you want me to get my head cut off by not letting you eat the meat and drink the wine from the king's table. Look at the persistence. Daniel says to Ashpenet, please. See, he knew what to do. He knew how to be intelligent. He knew how to be, he knew how to have personality that was winning and he used it in a persistent way. Please, sir, just put us 
uh, give us a little opportunity here uh, for 10 days rather than letting us drink wine and the king's meat. Give us vegetables and, and give us water to drink and, and, and let that be our lot as opposed to the wine and, and the king's meat. He was persistent. Do you know people who are uncompromising and unrelenting are people who are very persistent? You can't tell them no. They won't take no for an answer. When they know what they want and they know how they want it, they're going to go about it and you're not going to be able to stop them or deter them from what they really know is important. So persistent. But what comes with that persistence? I'll tell you, an unblemished faith. Daniel said to the man, now he doesn't know. He's never been in a situation like this before. He's never been outside of his homeland before. He has not been in Babylon before. He has not tasted the various cuisines from around the world before. He does not know dietary laws so much, but he says in faith, let us eat vegetables and drink water so that we will be all right. Now look at, look at his faith. Look at his faith here. See, there were other boys who were in the program too. Other boys maybe from Jerusalem, other boys maybe from other places that Nebuchadnezzar had brought into Babylon. But the idea is, I believe that if I don't defile myself with the food and with the drink from this culture and hold on to my faith in God, that my God not only will protect me, but he's going to keep me healthy and strong. That's faith. Faith, faith comes in process, y'all. You, 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 faith starts somewhere. And the faith that Daniel is going to need many years later when they put him in there with hungry lions got to start somewhere. And this boy is putting down his gauntlet with the Lord right now. He's saying, listen, I believe the Lord will protect me. I believe the Lord will keep me healthy. Now, 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 wait, wait, wait. I don't want nobody to leave here today and go home and tell your husband or your wife, baby, I'm not going to eat dinner today. Just bring me some water and some vegetables and I'll be all right. Don't, don't believe that now. The point here was not to say that it was more healthy to have vegetables and water than meat. See, I've always been a protein man myself. And I need a little meat. <laughs> if my wife put just vegetables on that table, we're going to have to have a different discussion. <laughs> Maybe where the protein? I got I to have some, some of that. But Daniel wasn't saying that for dietary purposes. He was saying it strictly because he believed that God would keep them healthy. And as a result of his faith, then he is given what I call an unusual test. And the test was, okay, check us out for 10 days. He doesn't know whether this thing gonna work. Give us water and vegetable for 10 days. Then come back and see how we look. At the end of 10 days, they passed the test because their faces were fatter and they were as healthy as any of the rest of the boys who drank the wine and ate from the king's table. And so therefore, Ashpenaz took away the king's plate and the king's wine from Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I believe he probably did it gladly, okay? Like it was in my house. See, it was 10 of us coming up. And if one of my brothers decided he didn't want his, 
the next one will say, I'll take his. And so I'm sure Ashpenaz would say, okay, you don't want the king's wine? Bring it over here. You don't want the king's steak? Bring it over here. Me and my boys will take care of it. And for three years, these boys only ate vegetables and drank wine, drank water. And at the end of those three years, here's what I want you to hear. They received an unmeasurable blessing. What was the blessing? At the end of time, it was now time for them to meet Nebuchadnezzar. It was graduation day. Three years have passed, and they now have got to sit down and talk with the king. And when they talked with the king, these four boys were found ten times smarter than the rest of the boys. And their faces were fatter, plumpier, healthier than anybody else. God blessed them. And God will bless you when you choose not to compromise with other folks just to get along. Sometimes compromising or not compromising will cause problems. Sometimes it will throw you into fits and it will cause people to come against you and it will cause people to rise up in your face. But when God is protecting you and when God is on your side and you're willing to hold on to his unchanging hand, you will see the blessing of God. I remember another incident in my life, man. I worked in the school system, too, for 26 years. And I remember, man, when the Lord laid it on my heart that it was time to retire from the school board. I went home to talk to my mom. I said, Mom, I'm thinking about retiring. She said, why? Why won't you? I said, I have two sons in college. And she looked at me, she said, you went to school and I didn't work. I said, I need to talk to somebody else. Finally, I went to the church and I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't want to make a mistake. If this is really you, I want to be obedient to what you want me to do. And I flipped the Bible that was there on the front. And it fell over on a passage in Matthew chapter 19 and the words jumped off the page that said, no man who has left father, mother, houses and land for my sake and for the gospel, who shall not in this life receive a hundredfold and in the life to come, eternal life. I said, wow, God, I hear you. So I went to my office and I wrote the letter of retirement. And I put it in the superintendent's hand. And my friends, man, jumped all over me. They said, boy, you crazy. You're going to leave a six-figure job to go to church to pastor black people? You're going to starve to death? Well, I'm here to tell you, I'm in the 37th year. And I have not looked back. And I won't even begin to give you no figure, but I can tell you that Lord has been good. He has blessed in immeasurable ways. Isn't that what he promised? Unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we are able to ask or think according to the power that's at work within us, God will take you places you never dreamed you would go. God will open doors that have been slammed in your face. God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. God will turn it out. He will show up and he will show out. And lastly, Daniel Daniel, out of all of the four boys, was given not only immeasurable blessing, but he was given unlimited influence. 
Daniel here is 14 years old, but he lives and he stays in Babylon for 70 years. And he's an advisor to not only Nebuchadnezzar, but he becomes an advisor to Belshazzar. He understands dreams and visions and he's given prophecies and he's given favor with God and man and he's there even to influence King Cyrus who dismisses the Jews and allows them to return back to their homeland of Jerusalem because of this man's uncompromised life. I know I got to leave you now, so I just want to challenge you. What about you? Are you willing to live an uncompromised life? The world needs people who can take a stand. America needs people who can take a stand. For right, that is. The community needs people who will take a stand. Families need men who will take a stand. Churches need people who will take a stand. The nation, the communities, everyone need people who will stand uncompromisingly for the word of God and be willing to live in right ways. And when you are that kind of person, God will make sure that your life is filled to the overflowing. Here's what Jesus said, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Not only learn of me, learn from me, learn about me, learn who I am, learn what I will do, learn how I will take care of you. And you will find out that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the word now is in your lap. What are you going to do? What kind of life are you going to live? Are you going to continue to float with the stream of people that's going all kinds of ways? Or are you going to put the brakes on and decide right here, right now, today, God, I want to live for you. Even if it costs me, I know that you're able to keep me. Whatever your choice is, this is your moment. The doors of the church are open. The doors open. The doors of the church are open. When we sing this song, anytime, if you'd like to unite fellowship with this church, get up and walk this way. One of these will take your hand. God will get your heart. And we'll begin a relationship that will carry you all of the way. Doors open anytime. My yoke is easy. Since I met Jesus, since I met Jesus, my life is no longer the same. It makes me want to run on, shout hallelujah, right to the end. Doors of the church open. Come on, Bob. Share it. Since I met Jesus.
it makes me want to run on and shout hallelujah right to the end. Oh, his yoke is easy. His yoke is easy. And his burden. results to God you do what's right and watch God do wonderful things with your life in your life and through your life 14 years old but look at what happened over the course of his life next week we're going to look a little bit more at what else God did it's going to bring our service to a close today thank you so much for worshiping with us we're going to stand together and we're going to sing the old hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, as we go forward into another week. One big choir, my faith. for your word we thank you for the example of Daniel we recognize that we live in some difficult times and we live in a compromising world and even in our nation right now where the political rhetoric is heating up and people are lining up on both sides of the aisle we pray that you would give us clarity and true Christian discernment as to what is right and what will please you. And may we then be uncompromising, unrelenting, understanding, 
with the boldness that we need to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. Among our children, help us to be bold as parents. In the occupations that you've given us, help us to take a stand for that that is right and pleasing in your sight. Help us to be the pace setters, to be the ones with the standards. And then may we feel your constant protection, strengthen and develop our faith. Help us to be persistent in our pursuits. God, reward your children with what we stand in need of. Give us the uncompromised, unparalleled blessing, even when we go through the test. Then, Father, we thank you for the influence that you're going to wield through our lives. We pray now a prayer of intercession on behalf of the sick among us. We pray for the bereaved families, wherever they may be. Some we know, some we don't know. Some circumstances we're privileged to understand. Others we have no idea, but you know it all. And we lift them before your throne. We pray for this nation. We pray for our national president. We pray for our U.S. Congress. We pray for law enforcement officers. We pray for the governor of our state. We pray for local officials, the mayors of the various communities, the city councils of the various communities, the county commissioners. And we pray that you would bless them to make good decisions that would be right for your people. And now, Lord, as we go our way, may you go with us. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your holy presence. As we ask again that the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, that he will rest, rule, and abide with each one of us, your children. Until we meet again, God's people said amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. See you next time.